Mm, Jai Gurdu, Jai Masters. One of the most important things for your spiritual growth and in the end for all of life is the difference between personal and impersonal. The way we use the term, impersonal sounds cold. He's very impersonal, not interacting. You're going to find out that impersonal is the warmest of all things, real impersonal. All right, first of all, what is impersonal? I've taught this and nobody believes me. Everything. Everything is impersonal. Everything. The clouds are impersonal. The rain is impersonal. Heat is impersonal. The sun is impersonal. All the galaxies are impersonal. The rings on the Saturn are impersonal. Everything's impersonal. The earth is impersonal. No person made it. It's been here 4.5 billion years. It's impersonal. It goes about its business. Everything goes about its business. The oceans go out their business. The fish in the ocean go out their business. The deer on our land, we have so many beautiful deer, they go about their business. All the animals go out their business. Everything goes about its business. It's impersonal. What does that mean? It has nothing to do with you. Nothing to do with you personally. There we go. I can use the words, right? <laughs> it has nothing to do with you personally. What does it have to do with? Itself. It has to do with the laws, God, call it whatever you want. I make no distinction between the word God and science. Because science represents the laws that are behind creation, you know, that, that run everything. Whether they understand that some intelligence made them that way, I don't care. The point is it's impersonal. Science is impersonal. How do you like that? Psychology is impersonal. It says that your psyche is the sum of its learned experiences. It's the sum of your learned experiences. And it is. Get one more experience, you think differently. Get rid of one experience, you think differently. You're not creating those experiences that you're having. Or are you? I know you'd like to. Well, you're not creating those experiences. They're happening. They're happening all over the place. I'm going to show them personal to you because what happens is if I talk about the two trillion galaxies and all the hundreds of billions of stars in every galaxy, you don't even blink an eye. It has nothing to do with you. It's impersonal. Okay? Why is the Earth any different? It's just one of the planets spinning around one star. There's 300 billion stars in your galaxy. And now we find out a lot of them have planets. A lot, way more than what we thought. There's exoplanets out there, right? Maybe they have life, maybe they don't. That's not what matters. What matters, you're just one of those planets. To everybody else in the universe, you're just a planet spinning around some stupid star out of 300 billion. If you went away, no one would know. I don't mean you personally. If the planet disintegrated, a few orbits would change in your solar system and would make no difference to the 300 billion stars in your galaxy or to the two trillion galaxies. Why? Because it's impersonal. It's impersonal. It's just impersonal. It's just what is. Now, you're able to handle it if I use the word impersonal for all those things. <laughs> the whole nine, how about this? For 99.9999999 to the 999th power, you agree it's impersonal. Well, where'd you come up with the point oh, 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 one? And why would you take personal? He doesn't. That's why it's personal. It's something you made up. It's something going on in your mind that's not going on in anybody else's mind. Has nothing to do with reality. It's just some fictitious thing that you made up in your mind that said, she's sitting too close to him. I don't like that. Oh, you're taking it personal. These galaxies are merging together, crashing into each other. So what? But she's sitting too close to him. <laughs> yeah, now you're laughing. Good. I want good laughter at the stupidity of this. <laughs> okay? You hear what I'm saying? Now you see a real big view of impersonal and personal. What made it personal? You. It's not personal. There are all kinds of people sitting various distances from each other right now out of the 8 billion people on the planet Earth. Imagine how many variations there are of who's sitting next to whom or who's doing what with whom. You couldn't care less. To you, that's the same as the galaxies and the stars and the rings around Saturn. You are making it personal. There is no personal. It's just go slowly. You agreed that all the galaxies and all the stars, which is everything, is impersonal. Now you've agreed that everything on this planet and all the 8 billion people and what they're doing is just as impersonal as everything else. What are they doing? They're doing what they're doing. 
you know, very Zen. And what Zen says, water's blue, flowers are red, grass is green. What does that mean? It is what it is. Things are what they are. That's what you feel about all the galaxies and all the stars and all the planets. And that's what you feel about all the people all around the earth. All the go- You don't have any idea what they're doing. You couldn't care less. Unless it has something to do with you. That's what defines personal. You feel it has something to do with you. Where did you get that subset? Because yours is different than his, isn't it? And yours is different than it was yesterday. So basically, now do you get it? There's this thing called impersonal, which is what? Everything. If it's 99.9999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999
They're staring at that picture. How long did it take when I stopped staring at the picture for you guys to show up? A billionth of a trillionth of a second. Did I expand my consciousness? I, six, I'm a 60s guy, right? They're talking about expanding consciousness. I will never use that ever again. I didn't understand when we used those words. Did I expand my consciousness when I stopped staring at that picture and then saw you guys? No, I stopped constricting my consciousness. My consciousness is fully expanded. It's capable of experiencing everything. In this room, at least, and, and the outside, I see that too, okay? That's a lot bigger than that picture. And I didn't have to pick a picture. I could have picked a dot. Stare at a dot. That's your universe. Now stop staring at it. Stop constricting, contracting, condensing your consciousness, fixating your consciousness on something, and it no longer is fixated on that. It didn't expand. It just stopped contracting. Do you see the difference? That is spirituality. That is enlightenment. That is what nirvana is. That's where the great ones went. Mayor Baba said when he first merged, he said, my consciousness was like a drop of water staring at me. That's what that drop of water was doing. Did it have to? Did it have to be limited to that? When he let go, he said that drop fell into the ocean. Find it. Find the drop. Put a drop of water in the ocean next time you're there and find it. What does it do? It merges. The word yoga means union, merger. That's all what it's about. Christ said, my father and I are one. The drop said the ocean and I are one. Well, it's true of you too, period. So you want to keep it all at a distance and talk about Christ or, you know, spirituality as a thing out there that your mind talks about. That's ridiculous. You are that. You are God, all universal being that was in the beginning. You want to say, Mayor Baba, who are you? You know what he said? I was in the beginning before all this was created. I will be in the end after all this falls away. There was never a time I was not. There will never be a time I am not. That's who you are. That consciousness that has always been and will always be. But it's staring at your thoughts, at your emotions, out your eyes. Consciousness is, isn't it? You're conscious, aren't you? Where's consciousness come from? You're so interested in what you're conscious of only great ones ask, where did consciousness come from? What's the source of my awareness? Not what I'm aware of. Again, these are the essence of spirituality, is you're seeking the source of being. You're going to called enlightenment self-realization. You realized who you are back there. Who is in there looking out through the eyes? Not what you're looking at. All you care about, and that's a generic you, includes everybody. <laughs> I don't think it personal. All you care about is what you're looking at. Is it what I want to see? Is it the color I wanted to see? Is she saying what I want to hear? Is this is she acting the way I want her to act? All I care about is what I'm looking at. I never paid any attention to who's looking. That's what spirituality is. When you start catching on, wait a minute, there's lots of things to see, but there's only one being that sees it, at least in you. Let's start there. It's the same you who looks out at her and looks at him, isn't it? It's the same awareness of being in here, that is focusing out there. But you are so fixated, just like the picture, you are so fixated at what you want to see and what you don't want to see. If you're looking what you want to see, you're completely fixated on it. If you're looking what you don't want to see, you're fixated on it. Come closer, get away. You now have left the seat of consciousness, come all the way down, that's the fall from the garden, came all the way down, and now you got to mess around with what's in front of you. Why? Well, because you can't let it be what it is. I can't let you guys sit so close together. Why? Well, I was 14. I had a relationship, and she really loved me, and we were wonderful. And then she went and sat next to somebody at lunch in school, and then they fell in love, and it hurt me so bad. Don't you dare sit so close. Now, I have a rule, the t- t- two-foot rule. <laughs> if you like me, you don't sit within two feet of everybody else. Do you see it? That's how it got that way in my mind. My mind is the sum of my past experiences. And my emotion is the sum of my past experiences. Now when I look outside, that's what's looking out there. I look through those patterns. And something either bothers me, I like it. And then if I like it, I focus on it. Because I like it. Stay here. I like you. Don't go away. I like this. I want this. I like that car. I like this. I want it. Or I don't like it. It has to stay away from me. I don't want to see it again. I'm moving. I'm moving. Because that car is in Gainesville, and I saw it once. I don't like it. I could have substituted that for my ex. 
Max still lives in Gainesville. I keep thinking about her and him. And when I drive by the restaurant where we used to eat, it hurts me. And I drive to the house where we used to live. I better move. There, same, same. You're so fixated on focusing on the outside that you never stop to say, who's in there looking out? Lately, I like asking the question. I used to do bigger pieces. Now I'm catching on. You need little pieces, right? Were you in there yesterday? Answer me. Were you in there yesterday looking out of those eyes? Were you in there yesterday watching those thoughts? He said, took a smaller piece because probably the thoughts were very similar yesterday. You're in there. Were you in there last week? Or was somebody else in there? You were in there, weren't you? Were you in there, now I've got to go bigger, last year? Have you always been in there? You just looked at different thoughts. You looked at different emotions. Why? Because you hadn't had the summer you learned experiences yet. You looked at the ones that were the summer you learned experiences then. But we are so fixated, the consciousness is fixated on staring at that. Why? Why? You know, Freud had a thing called the pleasure-pain principle. That was one of his strong things. He was, Freud wasn't far off, but Freud never asked who's in there looking. He never did. I looked at all of his things, all right, as much as I could. Freud never, he, he went into what's the mind saying, what's it doing, how's it work, what's it ego, id, broken into these parts. Very brilliant. I like Freud. But he never said, who's looking at it? Who's looking at that mind and noticed that there's ego, id, and superego? He was brilliant. He studied other people. He did self-inquiry. But never in any of his writings will you find Freud say, whoa, who's looking at that stuff? Isn't that amazing? <laughs> right? That's spirituality. That step back to realize someone's looking at the mind. So basically, you come down and you realize you have been in there the entire time. You stared at it. Why? Like I said, Freud said pleasure-pain principle. I say like-dislike. The Buddhists. What did Buddha say? He said the cause of the entire problem that ever exists, all suffering, is desire, is preference. The fact that you have a way you... Let's do that. The fact that you have a way you want it to be is the cause of all suffering. It's the cause of all your suffering and the cause of everybody's suffering. Do you have a way you want things to be? Do you have preferences? Yes. Buddha said the cause of all suffering is desire. What is desire but a preference? It's just another word for preference. I have a way I want it to be. What do you mean you have a way you want it to be? I've had, I don't know about you, I've had past experiences in my life that have been pleasurable. And I've had past experiences in my life that have been unpleasurable. Which ones do you want again? (laughs) I want the pleasurable ones. I don't want the unpleasurable ones. You're dead. You just ruined your life. Why? You're not interacting with life anymore. You're interacting with your past. You're interacting with impressions that got left on your mind based on your past experiences. And now when you look out at this world, you're not seeing what's there. You're seeing what you want to be there, or what you don't want to be there. And by the way, even if you're not looking at the world, your mind is thinking what you want to be there and what you don't want to be there. And it's thinking about how to get it to be there and how to avoid it from being there. It's completely fixated on these preferences. A normal human being's life is completely fixed on a preference. That's all it's about is preferences. What do I want? What do I not want? How do I get it? How do I avoid it? There. That's everything you're doing all day. Everything. All right? So what happened to the self? It got lost in that. Why? Because the pull is really strong. If something you like is in front of you, bye-bye. Leave me alone. I'm doing this. Leave me alone. <laughs> I said, Peter, no, I'm where I want to be. I'm feeling love. I'm feeling, no, I love what I'm doing. Leave me alone. That's what happens when you like it. But if you don't like it, no, get it away from me. No, I don't want to, all right? And then you spend your whole life thinking about how to get what you want. Is it true you're spending your whole life thinking about how to get what you want and avoid what you don't want? That's pretty weird. (laughs) You drop down onto a planet that is the Garden of Eden. There's orchids. There's flowers. There's wild flowers on the side of the road. There's birds that sing to you. <laughs> you don't pay them or anything, right? There's all kinds. It's a zoo. It's a veritable zoo. There's all kinds of animals crawling over the place, doing all kinds of stuff. Horses and this and rabbits. and Oh, my God. It's a zoo that its walls are gravity. Its cages are gravity. We had deer running around. I don't know where they all come from. I don't know whether there are more. It seems like there's more than there used to be. There's just always deer, herds of deer, eating, walking around, getting out of the woods, having babies. I didn't do it. You didn't do it. Everything is that way. 
all the flowers, all the plants, all the animals. And then there's all these people. And there's all these things to do. You can go to computer camp. You can go to cooking camp. You can go to dress up camp. You can do anything you want here. It's, it's a phenomenal place, isn't it? And what do you do? Suffer. <laughs> Listen to me. And don't say you don't. You suffer. Why? Because you have a way you want things to be and you have a way you don't want things to be. Well, I don't suffer when I get what I want. I'm not impressed. You suffer trying to keep it, don't you? What do you think jealousy is? What do you think fear is? What do you think fear of loss is? What do you think insecurity is? What do you think all that stuff is? I have a way I need things to be and I'm afraid I'm not going to get it and, and I have to keep it and get it and figure it out and dress a certain way and act a certain way and wear my hair a certain way and do every single thing a certain way. Why? So I can get what I want. And I better not say anything stupid because then I, I get embarrassed and people won't like me and I want them to like me. There you go. It's another like. You have these preferences that you have built in your mind. They make your life hell. Well, well not if I like something. Can we honestly talk? Let's say you meet somebody, you really, really like them. It's just you like them. It's just so beautiful. And you never get to see them again. How are you doing? Like is just as uncomfortable as dislike. Why? I have to have it. I have to have it. It has to stay with me. I have to figure out how to keep it. Dislike, I have to figure out how it doesn't happen again. In both cases, you're struggling. So the deep teachings are as follows. That is the problem. You think the solution is getting what you want and avoiding what you don't want. Simon says, take a step back. It is wanting and not wanting that make hell on earth. Why does everybody do what they're doing? Why do people invade other countries? Because they have preferences, fears, and desires. Everything, everything you read in the paper, everything that's going on, all the politics, every single thing comes down to like and dislike, preferences. Where'd you get them? You had past experiences. Are you a Democrat or Republican? Past experiences. Okay? You've got to be willing to understand it's personal. They're just your personal experiences. Are they meaningful? No. They are not meaningful. There are 700 billion zillion experiences you didn't have. The few that you had mean nothing. Right now, you're having an experience. How many are you missing? There's no number big enough, and that's just in Gainesville. How many things are going on in Gainesville you're not experiencing right now? How many are going on in Florida? How many are going on in the United States? How many are going on in all the Earth? Now that's the Earth. I told you 1.3 million Earths from inside the sun. 1.3 million Earths from inside the sun. You're missing all those experiences, and they're nothing. <laughs> 1.3 million from inside the sun, and there's 300 billion suns. You're missing a lot. Wake up. I've been picking on the bucket list concept lately, right? That's like, oh man, that's the neatest thing. What are you kidding me? What's your bucket list? That which hasn't happened to me yet that I think will make a difference. Well, but all the things that did happen to you, nah, they didn't work. Which makes you think this will work because I haven't had, you know, you know what's not on your bucket list? Something you already had, experience you already had. A bucket list by definition is that which I haven't, I haven't had the experience. I want to have this experience. I want to jump from a plane. I want to go to Mexico. I want to do something. It's because it doesn't work. It doesn't work to get what you want. The fact that you have a bucket list with six or seven or ten items on it, what does that mean? That all the experiences you've had so far weren't fulfilling enough. It didn't work. Before I die, I want these things to happen. What about all the other things that happened? And okay, you've had experiences, but I showed you. For every one experience you're having, you're missing 700 billion trillion. Therefore, what do you know? If you're the sum of your learned experiences, and that's the percentage of experience you had that there are, you know nothing. I mean, literally nothing, because you missed everything else. If you had had different experiences, would your mind be different? So what's this all about? It's about looking at that and realizing, oh my God, I have narrowed my world down to nothing. I'm just fixated on looking at the thoughts and feelings and desires and fears of just a little bit of experience that I've had. I miss everything else. And if they were different, I'd think different and be different. That's all. In the new book, there's a statement I'm trying to teach impersonal in that book that says, if your great, 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 great grandfather did not meet your great, 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 great grandmother, you're not here. So it's not just the experiences going on now. It's in the experience that ever happened that determines everything. 
so it's pretty broad, isn't it? You had like 3D chess. That's 65 degree chess. And you dare to drop down onto this planet and say, stop it. Stop what? Everything that ever was. Everything that ever caused everything to be. I have a way I want it to be. Really? Everything is the way it is because of everything that ever was. It's called cause and effect. It's a law that kind of lives around here. So it wasn't just your great, great, great grandmother. It was what happened yesterday. It was everything that happened to everything is what made everything be what it is. And you are making up in the midst of that dynamic, unbelievable creation. You're making up out of nowhere these tiny experiences you had and saying, no, this is how it should be. That's wrong. That should not be that way. People pick on me because I've said, I dare to say it, every single thing is perfect. Every single thing is the perfect result of every single thing that made it be that way. Every thought everyone has, every action everyone did, every weather, every single thing is the result of all the forces that made it be that way. What result? The perfect result. If you had all the forces and you put it in a computer, it would be a one-to-one, 100% correlation coefficient. I didn't say it was moral. I didn't say it was good. I didn't say it was just. I didn't say it was fair. I didn't say any other thing, did I? I just said it is the result of all that made it be that way, which is the entire history of the universe. So this is when you have a chance when you think like this, you use your, your intellectual mind, your abstract mind, your impersonal mind. Those are very impersonal thoughts, aren't they, that we just had. So you start off by saying, I am fixated on my thoughts, on my personal thoughts, on my likes and dislikes. Do you want to continue doing that for the rest of your life? Having these preferences, these likes and dislikes, and then complaining about everything and struggling. You struggle. You struggle with everything to try and make it be the way you want and make it not be the way you don't want. What would happen if you started, not finished, but started by honoring and respecting that the moment in front of you has got some serious history? Doesn't it? Like any of you that are into cosmology, there was this big bang 13.8 billion years ago. This is what's here now. Whoa. All the subatomic particles put themselves together based on the laws and this and that, and then you showed up. Well, so did the person in front of you who's yelling at you. Everything is the result of all that ever was. If you start there, your life is very different. Doesn't mean you don't do something about it. Nobody said you're not here to interact. It's here for a reason. You don't go to Disney World to stand there. It was made for a reason, right? You are here for a reason. But I can guarantee you that reason is not to make up the way everything's supposed to be. <laughs> I just, come on, just make up what Disney World's supposed to be like. Send the kid down there into Disney World, and he, he watched the web, unfortunately, and he made up, this is going to ride with me, and the ride, and this is going to happen, there won't be any lines, and the weather will be sunny, shiny, like Disney always is, right, right? And everything, and just make that up and see if the kid's not neurotic when you pick him up. <laughs> it was terrible. Why'd you just put me there? I thought you liked me. I didn't get to go ride with the way I wanted to ride when the lines were so long and, and the thing, and then there's a, there's a good world, small world. I don't want a small world. It's like, <laughs> that's not the version I heard. I heard the rock version, and they didn't play that. What would happen to that kid if that total preconceived notion of everything that was going to happen when, when they went to Disney World? They would not come back very happy, would they? That's what you did. So you got dropped down, your consciousness got dropped down into this phenomenal robot of your body that picks up everything, all the senses, and you're back here having all these varied experiences. What do you mean I'm bored? There's not a single thing that ever folded in front of you that's the same as what unfolded in front of you before. Nothing ever happens the same, ever. No electrons are in the same place. Every single thing is different. If you're bored, it's because you're staring at your mind. If you're unhappy, you're staring at your mind. If you're depressed, you're staring at your mind. You are not depressed. You have never been depressed. Nobody is depressed. They're staring at a depressed psyche. Consciousness is not depressed. If a light shines on something, the light doesn't become what it shines on. If the thing is broken, if the thing gets old, the light doesn't get old. That's what consciousness is. That's why they call it the light of consciousness. It's more like light than anything else. So basically, it, it, you're focusing your consciousness on a depressed mind, on a hurt heart, on different things. So at some point, you wake up and you realize, what am I doing? I'm completely caught in myself. 
I am completely caught in myself. You know how much you're caught in yourself? You like your face to look a certain way. I know that. So you go to one of those mirrors. I like those mirrors, all right? I don't have one. That turns, right? And if you look at it this way, you see your face. You look at it this way, you see the pits of the moon. <laughs> and you freak out. Oh, my God, look at that. What's that? Oh, it looks terrible. <laughs> That's what you're doing here on Earth. You're sitting, you're fixating, focusing. No, I don't want him to look like that. And no, I don't, don't, don't sit over here. Don't do that. And don't talk to him. And don't, say, well, don't you ever say that to me. My father talked to me that way. Don't you talk to me. Okay? So you wake up. This is spirituality. You can study whatever you want. You learn all the techniques you want. As long as you are paying attention to you, you're not going anywhere. Who said this? Christ. You must die to be reborn. That's what it means. You have to die of the personal. I have to stop staring at that, to die of that, to recognize the whole, right? Which is God. I mean, that's, there's God realization. But God realization is not the following. I want things to be the way I want. I've tried as hard as I can my whole life. I got most of them the way. I'm really successful. I got most of them the way I want, but I can't get everything. So I'm going to pray to get in this way. That's your God? That's your God. That's called God of the mind. Bring the universal being down to you, which is what's keeping you from him. Please, dear God, don't let them take that picture away. I'm staring at it. I need to see that. I don't have to change at all. If I change it, I don't know what's going on. I, I might wake up. No, I don't want to wake up. I don't want to wake up. I want to stay lost and drugged and fixated and addicted to things being the way I want. Help me get them that way. No. The great masters all taught the same thing about prayer. Let me have such devotion for you, for that which is beyond me, that my consciousness ceases to be fixated on myself. Every master taught you that. Christ taught you that. That's spiritual growth. So now we understand personal and impersonal. Personal is very simple. You're staring at yourself. Freud called it the id, ego, superego. They're all personal. He didn't go beyond the personal, but it's fine. He helped a lot of people. It helps tremendously, right? So what is the id? The id is your body's representative in your mind. You do think about your body, don't you? And when your body's hungry, your mind says, I'm hungry. Your mind is not hungry. <laughs> your mind doesn't have a mouth that can't eat. It doesn't have a digestive system. If it says, I'm hungry, doesn't it? All right? If something hurts your body, the mind says, ow, that hurt. No, the mind can't get hurt. You hear me? It's just a megaphone in there saying stuff that the body says it should say. Because you're in there. You know what I'm If you go far enough back in there, you're not going to feel your body. Go deep, 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 deep in the meditation. You don't feel any of your senses. You don't pick anything up. You've achieved a state inside where you're seated in the consciousness, which is not being distracted by the body. But the body, help me. So it screams up in the mind. That's what Freud called the id. That's so complicated, is it? That's all your desires, your bodily desires, and all this kind of stuff. So the id is part of the mind, isn't it? It's a collection of thoughts about the body. Well, what about the superego? What's it? Society has laid a trip on your head. And mommy's not there all the time. The preacher's not there all the time. Rabbi's not there all the time saying, don't do that, don't do that. Don't. But it is inside, isn't it? In your mind. So the superego is society's representative in your mind. Wow, far out. So now I got this id screaming at me. I mean here. I got the superego saying, don't do what he said to do. <laughs> you better not do that. So what do I do? You develop a self-concept. You develop a place in your mind, a set of thoughts that tries to bring peace between all of this. I'm the person who doesn't mind being a little bit wild. It's good. It's healthy. It's good, right? Well, I want to go to heaven. I don't want to do anything wrong. I'm so afraid of doing anything wrong, right? W where are you sitting? Who are you, what are you defining as me? That's what Freud called the ego, the self-concept. It's a set of thoughts. What you call you is a set of thoughts. This is what I like. This is what I don't like. So that which you define as you, what Freud called the ego, is the self-concept. What is a self-concept? What is a concept? What's a concept? Something you don't know about, you made something up about. What does a blood little bit taste like? I don't know, a banana. Just get a concept. Form a concept. That's not reality. A concept's not reality. A concept is in place of reality. 
So you have a self-concept, that which you think about yourself. It's not who you are. You're the one back in there noticing that your ego is giving you trouble. Do you notice that when things aren't the way it wants, it causes big trouble in there? Who notices that? Do you notice that things can get sad or happy in there? Do you notice that you have likes and dislikes? Do you notice that when you get what you like, you feel better? Who's in there? That's spirituality. The witness, the consciousness, the awareness of being, right? So now we had a nice course of psychology. You'll never forget again what it and super ego are, right? And you'll watch them inside your mind. I hope from now on, you'll watch your mind, talk id, talk ego, talk super ego. Now let's talk about ego, because that's the problem. Somebody once said to me, I like my ego. I said, good, go have fun. Why? If it's getting what it wants, it's not so bad, is it? Just have one person say one thing to you that isn't what you think should be said, and you see how you feel. Have one person that walks up to you and says, God, you're so special. I've always loved you ever since we were in kindergarten. I never told you. I was too embarrassed to tell you. You're really the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. How are you doing? Doing okay? All right. Now they walk over to somebody else and say the exact same thing. How are you doing? <laughs> There's ego. There's ego. In other words, you've formed concepts, views, opinions, preferences, hopes, dreams, beliefs, values. All of that is of mind. It's not of reality. If your values were of reality, you wouldn't be fighting for them. You just decided all this stuff in your mind. And now what happens? If the world is that way, you're okay. If it isn't that way, you're not okay. And guess what? You're not okay. Why? Why should the world, as the sum of its learned experiences, match the sum of your own experiences? You had yours wherever you grew up, and the moment in front of you didn't have those experiences, did it? The moment in front of you is the sum of all the things from the beginning of time and space that made it be that way. Your thoughts are the sum of your personal learned experiences. Are they going to match? What's the probability of them matching? And guess what? You know they won't match. That's why you worry all the time what to do about it. But what if this happens? What if that's not the way I want? What if he leaves me? And now you're out there fighting and manipulating and controlling, and now you have tension. Oh, I wonder why. All right? You have anxiety. I wonder what you're anxious about, that it might not be the way I want or it might be the way I don't want. Spirituality is transcendent to all of this, but it can't be while you're staring at your mind. If you keep staring at your mind, you're going to be an ego superego. You might be good at it, but that's not so good. So how do you free yourself? First, you have to want to. You have to want to understand that you're trapped. You're trapped in your personal self. You're trapped in your ego. And you have to sit there and say, I'd rather know God. I'd rather know what's beyond me. I already have my stomach full of me. <laughs> I've had my stuff. When I was 22, 23 years old, all right, I looked at him and I said, no, I don't think so. <laughs> Seriously. I woke up enough to look at it and say, I don't think we're going to do this for the rest of our lives. <laughs> There's no way in the world I'm doing this. Can you hear me? Right? Why would you want to do that for the rest of your life? Struggle and suffer and just do the thing and fight and complain and argue and just, oh my God. You, you drop down in the nicest. We have not found a planet even close to Earth. Not even close. I don't care if you all believe it. There must be something somewhere. We ain't found it. And we got James Webb telescope out there and the, the Hubble. We're sending probes all over the place. We didn't even find an amoeba anywhere. And you're sitting here and got dropped down. Your consciousness dropped down on the Garden of Eden, on the most beautiful place. And all you do is suffer and complain and fight and struggle and have anxiety. I know if you get it the way you want, it seems like it's going to work, but it doesn't stay that way, does it? Nothing stays. So at some point, you wake up. You wake up. And it doesn't matter whether you're 22 or 16 or 80 or 90. It doesn't make any difference. You wake up and you say, how can this work? The answer is it can't. Well, what does it look like when it doesn't work? Read the papers. Go visit Washington or Moscow or Beijing. It's all the same. It doesn't work. What well, doesn't work? To decide what you want and then go out there and try to manipulate a world that has nothing to do with you to make it personal, to make it look like you. <laughs> all right? Because nobody agrees with you. And so you wake up and you look at it and say, is there a way out? Yes. Really? There's really a way out. There's absolutely a way out, period. What? Stop staring at yourself. Well, that would do it. How? Well, that's the spiritual path. Spirituality is supposed to be about stepping back and letting go. The funny part about it is 
We don't need all these rules. If you were not caught staring at yourself and you were able to float back into the seat of consciousness, you would feel ecstasy, period. You'd feel waves of joy, rush of holy waters. You'd feel shakti, spirit. That's what's back there. That is spirit. Consciousness is chit shakti, conscious energy. Satchinanan, the eternal conscious ecstasy. That is the nature of the divine. If you get back there, even close, you feel that light pouring all over you. You are a great being. So spirituality is about freeing yourself of the world. No, freeing yourself of yourself. Freeing yourself of the stupidity of this ego. How do you do that? Not easy. Is it doable? Yes. Well, what if I've done terrible things? It makes no difference. None. Don't you ever let them lay on your heart. I don't even like to use the word karma. All right? When you get back to seat of self, all the karmic seeds fall off. Why? They're only there because you're staring at them. You're the one who collected your past. Oh, but I, I did bad things in the past. How long ago? 32 years ago. I wish I hadn't done that. Would you do it again? No. Then let it go. If you do it again, keep it. Then you need some remorse. But if you've gone through it and you learn from it, what do you, what do you think you're doing here? You came here to learn. Learn what? To let go of yourself. That's what you came here to learn. You did not come here to learn to get for yourself. You came here to learn that this is stupid to stare at yourself. The world is, the universe is much bigger than that. You have to learn to let go of yourself. How? Little by little, let go. Let go every day. You know what I teach? I'm interested in these really big things, all right? Like spiritual experiences. Don't bother telling me about them. I respect it. Why? They're in the past. I had the spiritual experience. I don't care about that. I care about the state of your being. I care about that which doesn't change. Where are you seated inside? Not you had an experience doing a drug or doing this or meditating for 27,000 hours. All right? Yes, you can have experiences, but you can't stay there. You didn't get rid of why you're staring at yourself. If every day, we'll do it very quickly, if every day you let go of yourself, what do you mean? You're driving in a car and the driver in front of you is driving 20 miles an hour below the speed limit. I have to live my own teachings. So I was driving the other day and literally it was a 55 mile speed limit. The person was going 35. I said, there you go, Mick. I said, let's set a new, you know, I said to her, come on, go slower. I said, Guinea's record. I'll send it to the Guinness book. Or, like, have fun with it instead of complaining about it. And there's nothing you do about it. That's letting go of yourself. Ego doesn't like it. They're not driving the way I want them to. You're on a little tiny planet and there's a little vehicle. And you can't even handle it, right? It's raining out. It's raining out. I have to get out of the car to deliver something. Why is it always to rain when I have to deliver something? That's ridiculous. What a stupid statement. The rain doesn't know you have to deliver something. <laughs> Talk about taking something personal. Why is it rain on the weekend? Why is it rain on my day off? Why does it have to rain on my birthday? One day a year, it doesn't have to rain. Is that personal? There's personal for you, all right? Man, wow. We do it with everything. Why is it so hot? It's hot because there's a star out there that is so hot that at 93 million miles away, you're complaining about the heat. Wow. Everybody tell you, Miami's 350 miles away. How big would a fire have to be in Miami for you to get hot up here? It would never happen. The whole city catch fire, the whole Southern California. You're not going to feel it up here. That thing's 93 million miles away. You should be going, wow. Well, anyone like stars? You know, like stars, you're so close to a star that you feel its heat. You can change how you're dealing with things. You can use positive thought. You can use mantra. You can use witness consciousness. You can breathe. But don't just allow your ego mind to tie you into it. Don't participate in it. Don't renounce it or beat it up or anything. Just, in fact, the Gita says, one should raise the self with self, not trample down the self. For self which is self's friend can become self's foe. It's dealing with uppercase and lowercase abdomen. You in there. Don't fight with your lower self. Raise her. Raise it up. When it's all said and done, all the energy inside of you, all the fear, anxiety, hate, lust, greed, everything needs to be rechanneled. You need to transmute those energies or you can't go up. Those are like a rocket ship. You're wasting the power of the rocket ship on all those lower things. When you rechannel them, they lift you up through all the centers. So don't fight with the ego. Don't fight with the lower self. Have compassion. Look at it. It's the sum of his learned experiences. So basically, you sit there and say, every moment of my life, I have the opportunity to let go of myself. I'm in here. 
you do notice it's weird in there, don't you? Okay, little by little, let the lower things go and train yourself to accept, to honor, to respect, to appreciate what is. You know how you get to middle school? That's, that, that's grade school, kindergarten, right? Middle school is as follows. You're doing mind your own business. Boss comes up. What are you doing? And, and you wanted to say what you told me to do. I never told you to do that. Why are you doing that? And you're like blown away that it once was an amoeba. <laughs> and it grew into this. And it's yelling at you. Wow! <laughs> That's far out, isn't it? <laughs> Raise yourself. Raise yourself. If you will do this and raise yourself every moment, where do you see what happens? You'll start to feel joy. You'll start to feel love. Why? Because you're not busy feeling the junk that you stored inside yourself. And every bit as you get closer back to the seat of self, it becomes higher and higher until literally waves of Shakti pour through you all the time. There's just this constant upward flow feeding you. That's what Christ meant when he said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that leaveth the mouth of God. In other words, you're not just living off the food, not just food, experiences that you're taking in from outside. There's this flow of energy inside of you. Okay, so you free yourself. You raise yourself little by little, just every minute, every day. Just do the best you can to raise the moments in front of you. And I'll close off. I have to close off because otherwise you'll all write me. But what about taking care of things? What about helping? And now I'm supposed to do something? Yes, you are. You're supposed to interact with the moment in front of you, not to make it be the way you want. That's the difference. Not because you can't handle it because you're a personal self and not because you want it a certain way personally. You have let go of the personal. You're feeling all this love, constant, upward, beautiful love. It wants to express itself. You'll find out when it's said and done, all you do is serve. And there's no rule or definition of service. There's a moment unfolding in front of you and nothing inside of you is personal in any way, shape, or form. All it is, is there anything that I can do to help? Is there anything I can do to raise this moment? Maybe not. Maybe a smile. Maybe a nice word. Maybe just being there with all this love, by the way. Okay? You don't have to do anything. That's what you become. You become a server. Instead of serving yourself, you're serving the moment in front of you. The highest life you can live is that every moment that passes before you is better off because it did. You can't live a higher life than that, can you? You can't do that when you're serving the personal. You will fight with those moments to make them be what you want and nobody else wants it the way you do because they all have their own experiences. So yes, you're an activist in that way. Not that I have a way I want it to be and I'm going to fight to make it be that way. Why? Because I can't handle the way it is. Well, that's not activism. That's just personal garbage dumping down, no matter how good it looks. Now, the same action done by someone who's clear may look the same. It's not the same. This person's serving. That person's taking. See the difference? I'm doing it because I can't handle it. I'm doing it because I want it. That's taking. When you're done taking, you're done with yourself. You just serve. All right. Now, you got personal and personal down? Okay. Thank you for listening. Mm, Jagger